Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we're back with another of our 5 Minute Histories videos and today we're going to talk about the Bagby Furniture Company building behind me um, here uh, near the corner of Exeter Street and Eastern Avenue um, in what we call today Harbor East. Back when this building was built in 1902, we would have called this part of Fells Point. Um, but before we get to uh, 1902 and before we even get to Bagby Furniture, which was started in the 1870s, let's talk a little bit about furniture making in Baltimore. Um, when we think of the biggest employers in the city, today we think about healthcare, Hopkins and the University of Maryland and Sinai and Mercy. Maybe 50 or 75 years ago, we would have thought about Bethlehem Steel and its tens of thousands of employees. Before that, maybe the canneries, the 75 or so that ring the harbor. And even before that, probably the B&O Railroad and the job magnet that it was. So where does furniture making fit in? Well, furniture making was never the biggest employer in the city, um, but it was a pretty big deal, especially in the late 1800s and early 1900s. But let's start in, 18, in the 1840s, and that's where furniture makers in Baltimore and elsewhere began embracing the use of the steam engine in the furniture making process. Before that, if you made a chair, for example, um, you started with raw lumber, and then each spindle had to be uh, uh, hand done into a, a spindle shape, maybe using a foot-powered lathe, and then all of that assembled by hand into your finished chair. With, uh, with the steam power, um, a lot of it was still done by hand, and a lot of it still required a lot of skill, but you could take that piece of lumber and turn it into a spindle a lot faster with a steam-powered lathe than with a foot-powered one. Um, and furniture began to be able to be made more uh, efficiently and also more cheaply. And in the 1840s and 50s, Baltimore became a hub of furniture manufacturing. For one, we already had a solid manufacturing base. We had folks in the city who were making parts for trains, were making parts for clipper ships, were turning animal hair into brushes. We already had uh, a bunch of folks with the know-how on uh, for furniture making. And we also were located in a transportation hub. Fells Point was a deep water port. It could accept these big lumber schooners, that's what they called them, um, ships full of lumber, particularly from the south. Um, and we had the railroads, the, the Pennsylvania Railroad and the B&O, where we could get lumber in, but also ship uh, uh, finished furniture out. Um, so we really started to thrive. After the Civil War, let me give an example. In 1870, there were 64 companies here employing about 800 people. By 1885, so 15 years later, we had 95 companies employing almost 2,000 people. Um, so really a big jump. Um, furniture made with the steam engine uh, was cheaper and it also sort of induced us as furniture consumers to start thinking about furniture differently. No longer did we just want a chair, we wanted a chair for our kitchen, a kitchen chair and a different chair for our dining room and maybe a different chair for our living room. And furniture companies responded by specializing. Some specialized in dining room furniture, dining room tables for example. Others maybe specialized in kitchen furniture. Some went on to specialize in office furniture because for, uh, for once you could have your furniture in your office be completely different looking from the furniture in your home. Um, incidentally, some companies took a totally different tack. Um, they emphasized the old world uh, handcrafted way of doing things. One of those in Baltimore was the Pot Hass Company. It got started in the 1890s um, repairing antique furniture, but also making new furniture in the older style, like the 1700s England uh, with Heppa White and Chippendale. Um, and they sort of marketed high end furniture to those who could afford it. Bagby, what was the opposite. They embraced uh, steam-powered manufacturing um, and manufactured furniture um, that was much more affordable. In fact, let me read uh, Let me read to you a few of their advertisements. Um, one of them uh, uh, boasted that they produce low and medium price furniture. Um, another one uh, said, quote, no better goods of this class are made in this territory. Um, and a third said that their uh, products were unquestionably of reputation for making 
buying and selling value, all caps, their words, um, in furniture. Um, maybe not the most jingly of advertisements, but I think they got the point across. Um, they were not the furniture for the 1%. They were the furniture for the rest of us. The company got its start in the 1870s when a gentleman named Charles Bagby teamed up with a gentleman named A.D. Rivers and formed the uh, Bagby and Rivers Furniture Company. Um, by 1897, uh, Bagby had bought out Rivers, so it became just uh, the Bagby Company. And they moved around a little bit uh, downtown. They started out on West Pratt Street, basically where the University of Maryland School of Nursing is today. Then they moved over to East Baltimore um, in what is now the Hohen Lithograph Building. It was theirs first. And then they moved down here in 1902 uh, to this building. They built this building. Um, and they moved here because this was basically the distribution hub of lumber in the city. Lumber coming in uh, through Fells Point and the railroads. The Pennsylvania Railroad had a terminus here on Fleet Street, um, so really an ideal location. And the company thrived. They specialized, um, uh, a lot of companies were specializing in those days. They specialized in bedroom furniture. Um, uh, one of their advertisements said that their specialties were bedroom suites and hat racks um, and chairs for your bedroom. So that was where you went for bedroom furniture. They also did a good job of uh, marketing and distribution. Um, for example, a lot of the bigger companies uh, sort of passed over small town America, Bagby embraced it and developed relationships with general stores in small towns across the country um, that sold its furniture. The company thrived even through the depression. In 1931, Charles Bagby retired and sold the company to a distant relative um, whose last name also happened to be Bagby, William Bagby. Um, that was fortuitous for the sign makers. They didn't have to change the name of the company. It kept chugging along as the Bagby Furniture Company. Um, and in the Depression, uh, the Bagby folks realized that they were not able to compete with the really cheap labor in North Carolina in particular. Their competitors down there were able to produce things really cheaply. Um, one of the things they did is started to turn to wholesale, um, selling other folks' furniture using their own distribution networks. By the 1940s and 50s, they still were manufacturing, um, but what they were doing is producing the parts in North Carolina, all the spindles for that chair, say, and then shipping them in crates up here to this building um, and assembling them here. Uh, Prefabrication is what that came to be called and they were really a pioneer in it. If you've ever bought a piece of furniture from Ikea, you know Ikea has taken that uh, to the extreme. That prefabrication process ends with you yourself doing the last stage of fabricating in your own living room. Well, in a lot of ways, Bagby was a precursor for that in the 1940s and 50s. Um, by the 1980s, they had stopped manufacturing and were really wholesale only. Um, they sold uh, uh, furniture from companies like Thomasville um, and and then Simmons Bedding. They were a big uh, bedding distributor as well. But by 1990, uh, the furniture distributors and furniture outlets uh, were out competing them and they closed their doors for good. But luckily for us, uh, a few years later, the redevelopment firm Struver Brothers Eccles and Rouse bought this building, um, rehabbed it, got it listed on the National Register of Historic Places, um, and turned it into offices and shops. And it's had a various, uh, various number of restaurants go in on the ground floor. Um, right now, I think it's got two Italian restaurants and a Verizon store and a PNC bank, um, and then full of offices on the upper floors. So not so bad for a nearly 120-year-old building that got its start with steam power making shift robes. All right, thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.